San Francisco, September 2018. Audi grabs the attention with a spectacular production. The Audi rings are formed by a swarm of drones. Audi presents what could be the most important car of the decade, the new e-tron. Warm welcome to San Francisco Bay. When you achieve something remarkable, you have caught lightning in a bottle. The e-tron marks Audi's entry into the age of electric mobility and the end of one of the most expensive development projects in the company's history. The new e-tron is the result of four years of intensive development. Thousands of people have worked on it, with testing on four continents. The development team has faced the risk of failure many times. No Audi project has ever involved so much pressure. Ingolstadt, a few months earlier. At Audi's development center, a team of senior developers meets to put the finishing touches to the e-tron. Only when they give the green light can series production begin. My name is Andreas Klemm. I'm the maturity manager for the Audi e-tron. My name, is Christoph Weber. My name is Christoph Weber. I'm the type manager and feature controller for the Audi e-tron project. Jens van Eichel is head of the e-tron model line. The purpose of the two-day acceptance road test is to see if the car is ready to go into series production. But the start is delayed. One part isn't doing what it should. The problem we have here is that the charger doesn't want to open the charging flap right now. It's a purely mechanical problem, but if the charging flap doesn't open, then the car is essentially a non-starter. What we need to do now is delete the error memory, then reset it and reconfigure it so that we can continue. So, the reparation started yet. A simple system reset is enough to fix the problem. For now, at least. Others have far bigger problems, like aerodynamics expert Gerhard Fickern. A sudden leak at the front end is significantly impairing the car's drag performance. This puts the ambitious development targets at risk. We have to, to find out what can we improve in the in the new parts in order to make to make them work properly and whether this is still feasible, we will see. Gerhard Wickern finds himself in a race against time. The road test begins. The e-tron is Audi's first all-electric vehicle and the first in the entire Volkswagen Group. With all other electric cars to date, the electric drive was simply installed in the existing bodies. But the e-tron was specifically designed as an all-electric car right from the very start. And yet, electric mobility is as old as the automobile itself. In 1900, for example, around 38% of all cars in the USA had an electric drive. Car makers have been experimenting with batteries and electric engines for around 130 years. The reason they never became commonplace is simple. Gasoline was dirt cheap by comparison. Audi and its predecessor brand DKW also developed many electric cars that never made it to series production. But that chapter is finally being written now. It feels very cool. As far as I'm concerned, electric driving is the next step. It's pretty exciting to say you're driving an electric car. It's a big step. In Brussels, they've been preparing for the big day for years. 
The venerable old plant is being revolutionized. No stone is being left unturned. This was once where the compact Audi A1 was produced. Now they're gearing up for a much bigger and heavier full-sized SUV. Building an all-electric vehicle with entirely different dimensions, 42% heavier than the A1, 25% longer, 15% wider and taller, means converting the factory. To give you an idea of the scale of things, over 7,500 metric tons of steel have been installed here, the same amount as in the Eiffel Tower. And there's another big challenge. Brussels is the first automotive plant in the world to have a battery production line installed. More unknown territory. The cells that arrive are bundled into packs in a largely automated process and combined in an extremely rigid frame to create the final battery. Meanwhile, in Gur in Hungary, Audi is ramping up its own electric engine production facility. Another unfamiliar area for a car maker. But Audi wants to make sure it keeps all of the future expertise in-house. Audi is also developing the batteries itself. At the battery test plant in Ingolstadt, the individual cells and the finished batteries are put through their paces. We do different kind of tests. For example, here we do some kind of uh, thermal tests. So we stress the battery, we charge them, we discharge them, and try to find out which situations are really important for the battery, for the lifetime, and for the safety of the whole system. But before the car can hit the road, another test is required. The battery has to be absolutely crash-proof before the road tests can get the go-ahead. So the challenge is um, to prevent people who are working with the car, who are sitting in the car, or let's say handle the car, um, are safe uh, against electrical uh, and electrical shock. Crashing an electric car with a fully charged 95 kilowatt hour battery presents the testers with entirely new challenges. All is clear. In the e-tron, the electric engines and the battery are installed where the engine, drivetrain, and fuel tank would be found in a conventional model. But one thing is the same for all cars. Safety is the top priority. Audi is dedicating vast efforts to this area. Safety problems are something it cannot afford as it enters the age of electric mobility. For this car and the technique is really new to Audi. To all of us, um, we did some more crashes, so almost 80 crashes. Back in project manager Jens van Eichel's car, the charging flap makes itself known again. I've just had another error message about the charging flap. I'll take the next exit. I got another error message saying that the charging flap hadn't initialized correctly. So we're taking a look at what the problem was. Okay. Okay, all fixed. Thanks, Andy. Let's get back on the road.
development work always throws up surprises and challenges. It takes a real passion for technology. So what we're doing at the moment is gliding. There is no active recuperation right now. I've deactivated the recuperation, and the whole thing simply cannot be compared to a combustion engine. We're effectively rolling along. The motor isn't doing a thing, and we have essentially zero consumption. That's what makes electric vehicles unique. We can glide for a while and then recuperate using the pedals whenever we want to. For me, gliding is the most fun of all. <laughs> Recuperation, energy recovery, in other words, is essential when it comes to increasing a vehicle's range. The e-tron recuperates almost every time the car slows, and not only in cruising mode. The electric engines feed energy back into the battery almost every time the normal brake is operated. To present this revolutionary concept to the public, Audi invites international journalists to a location that occupies a special place in the company's mythology, the legendary Pikes Peak. Pikes Peak, Pikes Peak. over 14,000 feet high. The majestic scenery of the Rocky Mountains around Colorado Springs. Qualification for the elite class, the rally cars. Walter Röhr heads off on one of his biggest adventures. The spectators here have never seen anything like it. European driving style of the highest quality. Car number one is Walter Röhr's Audi. After 12.4 miles and 156 corners, the finish line at the top of Pikes Peak. An absolute record time, 10 minutes, 47.85 seconds. The champagne flows at 14,000 feet, a proud champion and another triumph for the car maker from Ingolstadt. The prize in 2018 is rather different. This time, the almost 12 and a half mile route is being driven downhill. With a gradient of around 7% and an altitude difference of almost 5,000 feet, a true test for any brakes. This is where Audi intends to demonstrate the benefits of recuperation. As well as converting kinetic energy into electrical energy, recuperation protects the brakes. The electric engines slow the car. What this means is the electric cars of the future will cause very little in the way of brake, wear and tear. My name is Stan and I'm a ranger here on Pikes Peak. And this is uh, a spot um, about eight miles down from the top. And what we're doing is we're checking people's brakes. We want to see uh, how much they've been using the brakes. Have they been driving down in low gear and letting the transmission work, or have they been using the brakes? And the purpose is um, the next four miles down the road, that's the steepest section of the road. So if they have hot brakes here and they continue, they could have failures. You guys are 48 degrees. And the ground is 45 degrees there. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. So it's very impressive. Most cars don't get below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those that do, we have a reward for our drivers. We give them candy. <laughs> Smarties for smart drivers. <laughs> We've just driven down from Pikes Peak in the new Audi e-tron. From an altitude of over 14,000 feet down to 11,500 feet. And we've not used a single bit of energy in the process. We've just taken the brake temperature, 53 degrees Fahrenheit. We've seen cars here before with a brake temperature of over 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Every last bit of energy is fed back into the battery, making the whole thing super efficient. The technical manager of the project, Markus Zivat, explains the unique benefit of the system. The best way to show the customer the benefit is if we always recuperate whenever the vehicle slows. 
So we looked at the brake. It's brake by wire. So the car decides whether to recuperate electrically or whether it needs to engage the hydraulic wheel brake. I would say that energy is recuperated via the electric engines 92, maybe 95 percent of the time. Audi's spectacular appearance at Pikes Peak also provides some surprising insights into the business practices of its competitors. I'm really excited about the Audi because Tesla does not like to invite automotive press to a lot of their events uh, or to drive any of their cars really. So for me it's really cool to actually get to drive a new electric car uh, that's not a Tesla because we don't really get to drive Teslas all that much either. Um, but it's nice to have competition. You know, when you have one company that's controlling the market, you uh, maybe lose uh, some of the development gains that happen as a result of having a lot of companies competing in a certain market. So I'm excited to see where this technology goes because we have new people coming into the marketplace. It's true, the competition never sleeps. The fight for the first electric customers in the premium segment is extremely tough. The pioneer in the field, Tesla, has now lost much of its mystique. Production problems in particular have damaged its image. Things are moving quickly at the established manufacturers. Jaguar is launching its first all-electric SUV, the I-Pace. In Germany, too, electric mobility is really starting to get moving. Just like the Audi, the Mercedes EQC was presented to the public in the fall. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The technical concepts for all three cars are very similar. SUV bodies, large batteries between the axles with a capacity of up to 100 kilowatt hours, one electric engine at the front, one at the back, and a range of over 250 miles as standard. In 2019, Porsche will join the market with the Taycan, whose performance specs are said to be even better. Seriously tough competition, in other words. The deciding factor could end up being the best charging strategy. Audi has the advantage here, as the e-tron can be charged at up to 150 kilowatts, making it ready to drive again quicker than any other car right now. To illustrate this, Audi is arranging a very special event in Berlin. At the Siemens High Voltage Laboratory, several hundred thousand volts are used to generate some spectacular visuals. to inform the public about Audi's future charging strategy. Simply building an electric car will not be enough. To this end, Audi and other manufacturers are working together to establish a dense network of fast charging stations throughout Europe. Andreas Klem's team stops for a quick charge before hitting the road again. Meanwhile, at the wind tunnel in Engolstadt, a new test series is being prepared with prototypes. Gerhard Wickern believes he's found a solution for his aerodynamic problem. In testing the prototypes, we realized that the seal around the radiator section isn't doing what it should. And now we have a second car with a new radiator seal that we developed additionally. But it wasn't really any better. The pressure is mounting on Gerhard Pickern. A solution needs to be found in time for the start of series production. Time is running out. I'm a natural optimist, but I never rule out the possibility that something will go wrong. The first day of the acceptance road test comes to an end. 
time for the Audi team to review the events of the day over dinner. <laughs> They were driving around us, cell phones pointed at us from every window, especially when you were on your own. Everywhere you looked, you were being filmed. The head of the model line, Jens van Eikels, explains what makes the e-tron project so special. We were a lot quicker than normal. We always had three months in mind as our deadline. It was very important for us to include winter in our tests, if only to ensure that we had the depth and breadth of testing you need when you're building a car like this for the first time, so that low temperatures and high temperatures are included in the test process twice. Lapland in the depths of winter. Time for another round of cold tests. Like every other Audi, the e-tron needs to work perfectly in all weather conditions, including over 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. This is where batteries in particular are pushed to their limits. We're in the cold chamber on the test site and are simulating a cold start with a preconditioned battery. We precondition the battery, which means we place the vehicle in the cold chamber and freeze it. We test various battery charging levels in order to ensure that everything works as it should in the cold, even in these extremely tough conditions. Here we're testing the cold starting ability, the robustness of the components, making sure all of the software functions work smoothly even in extreme temperatures. Cold weather is especially challenging for high voltage batteries. The large battery pack in the vehicle has to be warmed in order for the vehicle to enjoy maximum performance. Achieving this takes considerable effort in the area of thermal management. The safety of the cells also needs to be guaranteed, and we obviously want to be able to demonstrate the full performance of the Audi Quattro right from the start. What sets the Audi e-tron apart from many of its competitors is that it already has trailer certification. Looks nice and stable. The trailer is running smoothly. The difficulty on ice and snow is that the friction coefficient is very low, so the ESC interventions have to be calibrated with great precision in order to stabilize the car and trailer combination. The oscillation increases and you can see the brake intervention there. It's crucial that the e-tron is a real Quattro albeit built on entirely new technical foundations. A real challenge for the drive developers. The main difference in terms of the e-tron Quattro all-wheel drive is that it uses two electric engines, one on the front axle and one on the rear axle. This gives us new freedom in development and the rapid control dynamic of the electric engines is especially useful. Even in Lapland, the Quattro makes for an enjoyable drive.
months earlier, almost 7,000 miles to the south, Audi engineer Christoph Weber is preparing another extreme test. Today we're in the middle of nowhere, in a salt pan in Africa for hot climate testing. Today we'll be doing heat tests. This prototype is subject to the strictest secrecy, so we need to protect the car. I've been on the road for three weeks and have racked up 1,800 miles, all of them electric. Two tests are on the agenda today. First, the dust proofing of the front section will be tested. Then the car will be put through multiple rounds of maximum acceleration to make sure the drive doesn't overheat. My colleague is up ahead there. Philip, you can start. I'm ready. And we're going to do a dust cloud test. We're driving into the dust thrown up by the car ahead in order to see how much gets into the technology compartment in the front section of the car. My colleague is using the minibus to generate the dust. You need two people to do the test, in other words. Now I'm looking for the dust we expect to have got into the technology compartment, but there's nothing there. There's no dust in the technology compartment. On to test number two. The thermal management of the engines and the battery need to work perfectly, even when the outside temperature is above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Not every electric car can say that. Now we're going to do the start performance test with a VMAX speed of over 125 miles per hour. Another surprise in store for Christoph Weber. Das ist interessant. Now that's interesting. We'll have to take another look at that in technical development. We need to taper this gap or add a cover so it doesn't collect sticks and leaves. The tests were a success. We've got the measurements we wanted. And I'm looking forward to a nice cold beer. In the sandy deserts of Africa and the frozen wastes of Lapland, an SUV is the perfect concept. But that's not why Audi chose this body type. The real reason was the customers. We have 
We conducted a number of customer studies in which we showed the vehicle design to future customers in this area. We wanted to be sure that it would be accepted in all three global markets. And this is why we opted for an SUV, and why we kept addressing the conflicting objectives of aerodynamics and the SUV look. Feedback from customers was really, really important in this process. We conducted studies in the USA, in China and in Germany, and continuously asked ourselves, are we on the right path? Is our concept the right one? The SUV concept has many advantages. When it comes to making sure it looks good, that's where head designer Mark Lichte comes in. The Audi e-tron is extremely important to us. I'd go so far as to call it a milestone for us. Stefan Farbecker and his team are responsible for the specific implementation of the design. The SUV segment is an ever-growing segment. But secondly, the package that we got is, from the design, exterior design point of view, from the proportions, perfect for an SUV. Because you sit on the battery, you have the high seat position anyway, and it was possible to create a really nice SUV proportion. We also wanted to show where is the battery. That's why we included this e-tron signature, this horizontal element which is also illuminated on the right-hand side of the interior. Then there's the virtual side view mirror, which is optional. As you can see, it's very small in terms of volume, and it adds a good mile and a half of range by optimizing the drag coefficient. The virtual side mirror is something that we put on show cars for probably the last decade or even the last 15 years. And we always knew it's going to be really hard and we were probably never going to see it on a production car. And this time, we also as a designers and I think the whole development team was really glad that we had the possibility to finally put it in a production car. It wasn't so much of a problem in terms of the exterior design, but I think our interior design colleagues had a lot of work on their hands to be able to integrate this OLED display into the door. It really looks like swoosh, you've integrated it beautifully into the interior. That's why it all fits together so well. <laughs> you can see it from the black panel here. It stretches outwards, making the panel look wider. You don't get the same effect with conventional mirrors. Emmen, Switzerland. Home to one of the few wind tunnels in Europe where you can get really dirty. We meet Gerhard Wickern and his team again. Their task today is to see whether the virtual side view mirror gets dirty in bad weather and if it provides a clear view to the rear at all times. This wasn't always the case with the first models. Fluorescent water that is visible under ultraviolet light is added to the wind flow. You can see how the water flows around the mirror. Gerhard Wigan is satisfied. After several attempts, they now have the results they wanted. We can see that some of the rain lands on the wing, then runs backwards. And this is the first thing we added, a groove that acts like a kind of water channel. It collects the water and guides it down to here, where it dissipates without ending up anywhere that it shouldn't. The start of day two of the acceptance road test. From Berchtesgaden back towards Ingolstadt. Michael Neumeyer has now joined the team and he's looking forward to the drive. This auto is aufgrund 
this Thanks to its low center of gravity and the large battery ideally positioned low down between the wheels, the car is incredibly nice to drive on roads like this one. Driving up and down mountain passes is a lot of fun. We've been known to give the odd sports car a surprise on drives like this. <laughs> to ensure that the e-tron lasts an entire car lifetime, it also has to spend plenty of time on the road simulator. What we're looking at is a servo hydraulic full vehicle test bench. This test bench is used to put the vehicle through the same loads and stresses that a customer would subject it to when driving. What these numerical simulations illustrate very well is the interaction between the body and the battery. What you're seeing is exaggerated by a factor of 75. And you can see the reciprocal effect between the body and the battery. The body benefits from the rigidity of the battery compartment, but the battery also has to be protected. Looking at the vehicle as a whole, these weld points started to become noticeable after around 22% of the runtime and came apart at 50%. We ran a simulation. And as expected, there's too much stress at this point. The solution is remarkably simple. The weld point is shifted downwards by a few millimeters and the problem is solved. Meanwhile, in Brussels, the first pre-series models are coming off the assembly line. The number of vehicles produced will be gradually stepped up over several months. The aim is to optimize the assembly process so that the car can be delivered in perfect Audi quality when series production begins. This requires seamless interaction between quality control in Brussels and Ingolstadt. Bavaria is home to the Master Jig, the one-to-one -one original model that is used for all measurements. The Master Jig, you can see in the background, is a tool we use where development meets production, so that we ultimately have a standard, a master reference point for series production. The term master speaks for itself, while Jig describes the frame that is used to place components in an ideal environment for them to be optimized and ready for series production. Time to check in with Gerhard Wickern and see if he's solved his aerodynamic problem yet. So the solution is uh, modifying this uh, cooling flow duct. Uh, now the, the duct is made completely from the stiff material. And uh, the, the explanation is that we also changed uh, the front bumper. So we added uh, foam parts in the inner part, replacing the soft part of the flow duct and now uh, this stiff flow duct uh, uh, has a good sealing to the front bumper due to these additional foam parts. All clear in the wind tunnel, Gerhard Bickern gets the result he wanted just before the finish line. Andreas Klemm and his team have reached Ingolstadt at the end of their road test. They're greeted by former technical development director Peter Mertens. We took the car over Alpine passes and the Rosfeld panoramic road. We really put it through its paces. And were there any issues? The handling is very good. Might say it's ready to go into series production already and it's really good fun to drive. 
This is an extremely important car. It marks the dawn of a whole new era. The e-tron will be followed by a whole range of different electric vehicles. For us, it's the first step into the future. Four years of development work are coming to an end, a time that's left its mark on Andreas Klemm and his team. For an engineer, the development we've made over the last few years alone is like the leap forward from the steam train to the electric locomotive. A revolution is taking place, and being able to say that you were part of it means a lot. The last four years have been very interesting, very instructive. I enjoy getting behind the wheel of this car every time. Everyone who drives this car for the first time is blown away. And we now have the feedback from the very early test drives. The car is perfect. Now just finish it.